us out here with a broken heart and praying for India. And as uh, Pastor C.S. Matthew mentioned several prayer requests, I figured, and I also felt led to pray before we start, pray for India, pray for the prayer requests that Pastor laid before us. So young and old alike, let us look to the Lord this morning. There's a lot of suffering people in India right now. Hallelujah. A lot of kids without parents, especially in the, in the household of God. Many ministers are, are leaving this earth. And it's a sad situation what is happening. We, we've seen all the news clips and everything like that. It is a, just a combination of a, a lot of bad things all at once. And people are crying out to the gods they, gods they know. But we know our God is in heaven. He is seated Hallelujah. And let us look to Jesus this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to your throne of grace this morning, O oh God. God, you are a God of compassion, O oh Lord. You're the God who sees the downtrodden and needy, O oh Lord God. You're the God who sees everything, O oh Lord, even down to the crying baby, Lord. You see it all. And Lord God, we come before you, O oh God, as your children, asking, O oh God, for deliverance, O oh God, in the land of India, O oh God. Hallelujah. Just as those numbers have been coming up, I pray, oh God, by your power, those numbers will come steeply down, oh God, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. We pray for the families that are undergoing so much trial and so much, so much stress this time, oh Lord God. And I pray your comfort will come upon them, oh Lord, hallelujah. I pray, oh God, for your grace to shower upon that land. And I pray that people will come to see and know that you are Lord. So, Lord, we trust that the battle belongs to you, oh Lord God, and Lord, only do what you can only do, O Lord. Stretch out your arm of healing, O God, upon your people, O Lord. And help us to see, O God, a change in the situation. We pray all this, O Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, for the time that is before me, I, I would like to cover a very important topic. Um, pulling from Acts chapter 11, 12, and 13. Um, we are all members of a local church, IPC Hebron, and sometimes we, um, we don't have the full understanding of what a local church is all about. You know, what is really, what is the local church? Is a local church a, 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 a building in a location? It's a local church, a place we come to watch people talk on the stage and sing on the stage. It's the church, a two-hour live video presentation that is streamed online that has the state-of-the-art sound and video equipment and all the capabilities. The truth is the local church is none of those, these things. So this morning as I was sitting down, I was trying to come up with a definition and, and again, I'm not saying this is my definition. This is from just a lot of, you know, a lot of things that's poured into me by this church and, and through other sources. And, and so in the next slide, I, I give a, a definition of the local church. And I want to start with that definition. And then we can go into the book of Acts and pull some things from it. So this is the definition that, and again, it's not a perfect definition. I know there'll be things I, I missed in here. Some of it I added into some of the other, some of the words. But the local church is an expression of the universal body of Christ that meets together regularly to build up each other to the full stature of Christ and to e equip each other for ministry through the proclamation of the word and corporate prayer by exercising spiritual gifts, by putting into practice the one another commands, and by celebrating the ordinances of baptism in the Lord's table. This, you might ask, where's the singing and, and where's the worship in all of this? Well, that is in the one another commands. But um, the local church is a foretaste of, of the final gathering of the universal church. Local church is where the rubber meets the road. You know, often we think, if I can only live my Christian life without people, you know. You know, that's the truth of the matter, right? We come to church and then one comment. Somebody says one comment that is very hurtful and then. We ask the Lord, Lord, I was coming in with so much passion to worship you. And then this one comment totally changed my mindset. The local churches where iron sharpens iron. The local churches where individual believers see the power of the Holy Spirit manifested to their brothers and sisters. 
to local churches where believers are discipled and encouraged. So if you have lost the beauty of the local church, my prayer is that you would see that beauty once again. Amen. Hallelujah. So saying all of that, let us read some portions from Acts chapter 11, 12, and 13. Um, and I've told the team to pull those up as, as I read them. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 11, 27 to 30. It says, Now in, in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there will be a great famine over all the world. This took place, took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Acts chapter 12, 1 through 5. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to the four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out of the people. Verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now going on, verses 6 and 7. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And I'm skipping just for the lack of time. Verse 11, on chapter 12. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of the Herod and all, all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer, recognizing Peter's voice, in joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter knock, continuing, continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. And motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now skip to 24 and 25 of verse, uh, chapter 12. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Now finally, let's read chapter 13, 1 through 4. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I have put together all the thoughts from these portions to, for us to see what are the elements of the local church just from this portion alone. Like if, when we look through all of the book of Acts and other scripture portions, we, we're probably uh, going to see a lot more things. But I just wanted to focus just on these verses. Um, and so I'm just going to cover six of these elements. And I don't know if it's on the screen uh, behind you, but it, 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 you, you'll see uh, it is now. Um, you see six elements here highlighted in the, in, the, in the verses that we just read. And I'm just going to read them. We see the word. We see fasting and prayer. We see giving. We see missions. We see spiritual gifts, exercise, and we see worship. So I'm going to go through each one of these fairly quickly, and I, I feel led uh, in the Lord to do something different, and if, if the Lord allows, we will do that. If not, you know, another time. First of all, we see the word. 
being preached and taught. We read in Acts chapter 12, 24, the word of God increased and multiplied. And this is in the, in the climate of Herod. He was, he was encouraged by the cheers of the Jewish people to kill away these leaders of the church. He killed you know, James, the, the brother of, uh, of, uh, of John. And, and then he got Peter and intending to make a public spectacle. You know, the night before that public trial was going to happen, we see the church, because of the church prayers, Peter was delivered from the prison. In Acts chapter 13, we read about Antioch. At the, at the, at the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. These teachers were teaching from the word. That there, was a, there was an importance given to the word of God in the early church and even uh, by his grace in the church that we are in today. One of the things I praise God about is the importance that this church gives from its inception for preaching the true word of God. And Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. That is the onus and the responsibility that is given to those who have been appointed for this task is to preach the word in season and out of season. It doesn't matter when it is. In good times and in bad times, you remain consistent in doing your job and fulfilling your ministry of preaching the word. Hallelujah. And moving on, the second thing we see here is the fasting and prayer. The church is gathering together for fasting and prayer. Acts 12, 5 says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Just imagine that situation. One of their... I mean, this is one of the three closest disciples of Jesus, you know, right? Uh, Peter, James, and John. James was beheaded by Herod, and then Peter was taken. So imagine the church in that situation, uh, the, the desperate condition the church is in. So the church came together. They gathered together to fast and pray, to pray uh, for, for deliverance. Acts 12, 12, after Peter was de delivered, we see the details. Even Peter didn't know that he was delivered. If you read the, cont the passage, you see that he thought it was a dream until he came out and he was like, oh, this actually happened, you know. And so when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who's also named Mark. And this is believed to be the Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark with the, with the help of um, Peter. And many were gathered together and were praying. So in the house of Mary... There was a large group of people praying specifically for Peter. And if you read, I mean, you read the story, right? You've heard this before. Even the those praying did not believe when the servant girl that was there heard Peter's voice. And she believed it with all her heart that, Peter, that deliverance has happened. And she tried to tell everybody, but nobody believed her. And isn't that the true state of sometimes in our prayers as well? We just get in the motion of praying and praying and praying and praying, forgetting that Forgetting that thirst that we have for deliverance, you know. And so this is the early church as well. Praying and praying and praying. Somebody says, hey, Peter's at the door. And they're like, no, you're crazy. And they keep praying and praying and praying. And, and so this is something to look at in our own life, right, and uh, how, how we pray. Um, and so th verse, uh, sorry, Acts 13, 1 and 2. Now there were uh, at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, and Manaean, and uh, uh, I'm just skipping a little bit, and Saul. <clears throat> While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. And so they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them and sent them away. So we see, we don't know the reasons why that Antioch church came together, but they were worshiping God and they were fasting. And then the Holy Spirit speaks. And, and sets apart two of the, their, their most important people in the church. And, and what do they do? They keep fasting and praying. They just want to be, and that there's some, some lessons to take in that, that even when the Holy Spirit uh, reveals something, it is our responsibility to confirm and test and verify. So they continue fasting and praying, and after that, they laid their hands on them and sent them, sent them away. Now, there's a kind of a trend happening, in, 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 in especially during this COVID season, um, a a move to um, discount the importance of corporate prayer. The, um, 
because we're, we have been so used to corporate prayer, that is really the lifeblood of this church, I would say. We get to gather together Monday nights, and you know, whenever we have an opportunity, we come together to, to pray together. And, and among some, because the vision of, the, 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 vision of the, the, the power of corporate prayer has lost, there is now just a, a move towards taking prayer to individualizing prayer to just on your own. And, um, and many times what's quoted is Matthew chapter 6. You know, when you pray, you must not pray like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and street corners that, that, that they may be seen by others. But truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And the father who sees in secret will reward you. And that is kind of the verse that is pointed to sometimes because let's, let's admit it. There is a tendency for us to be more prayerful in public than in private. That is a struggle that I think uh, most, uh, most people have. And, uh, but what Jesus is talking about here is about hypocritical people like the Pharisees who have no passion to pray. They, they don't care about even talking to God. They are praying only for the sole purpose of showing their spirituality. And so they pray in public places. They love, it says they love to you know, this is their this is their drive. They want to st- uh, stand in the corner, street corners, and just pray in public. And so Jesus is saying that they have already received their reward. And this is why we need to be careful, really, when uh, we know people in our congregation who are prayer warriors. There's no position called prayer warrior in the Bible, uh, but we acknowledge some people are more that that are more prayerful than others. And maybe sometimes it's best to not praise them. Sometimes it's best to. Let them be. So that they, let them receive the reward for their actions. We go out our way of, of sometimes praising people too much, and it brings about pride. And also, Jesus said, they have already received their reward. You know, when a couple of people tell some great things about you, you have received your reward. And, and I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, I think all of us rather receive heavenly rewards, receive the acclamation of Jesus, and hallelujah. And so sometimes it is best to keep encouragements to a minimum. I mean, you have, to up, you have to uplift people who are downtrodden, but, you know, sometimes we need to just thank the Lord for what God is doing uh, through the, all the prayer warriors and, the, and the, everybody who is ministering in the, in the church of God. So what I'm saying is this, that we're seeing here through the book of Acts, especially in these portions, the church is gathering together there is importance in individual prayer. Your corporate prayer won't be as, as good if, you're in, if your individual prayer is lacking. You would always feel like, man, I, I wish I could just pray on my own when you're praying in a corporate setting. Um, but if you have a strong individual prayer in, in, the, in, the, in the secret place, in the, in the closet, you can come with power, right? When, when, when you have a strong individual prayer life, your prayers in the corporate setting, in, in, this, in this church setting, will be even more powerful, that God would answer the prayers of the righteous when they pray together. So um, let me keep going forward. Number three is giving. When Agabus, and this is Acts chapter 11, 28 to 30, when Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there were a great famine, there would be a great famine all over the world, the disciples determined according to their ability to send relief. What were they sending? They were sending either money or goods to the brothers living in Judea. And they sent Barnabas and Saul to deliver that, that money and, and goods. That request has been made here this morning, and I praise God for, the, uh, for that request being made. That You know, when we think about money, and this is a vast topic, its own message, but... Um, you know, I think we all try our best to give our tithes in the best of our ability. And we often hear this, but I will repeat it again. 10% is just a minimum. 10% is barely getting through the door. Our attitude when it comes to giving is that we bring our 100% to God and we tell the Lord, Lord, I'm willing to cut things up for my life I'm willing to pay down this debt and not incur unnecessary debt and unnecessary expenses. I want to put it all aside, and I want to give this to you. Tell me, Lord, where my wealth needs to go. Now, 
depending on depending on the season of your life, you might have children and you, you might have other you might, you might need to help your parents and and all of that is there and and that's all part of your responsibility. You must do that. But you know, the Lord also is gracious to give us more than we ever need. And so that's where we bring our 100% to the Lord and we say, "Lord, this is yours, not mine." But I praise God for those who have a heart to give and this is one of like just like the early church who who according to their ability it says they they sent relief to the brothers living in Judea let us also if the lord leads you do the same for the the people in india especially for the churches in india who really need our support hallelujah four is a uh, uh, missions um acts 13:3 after fasting and praying they laid their hands on them and sent them off J.D. Greer, he is the president of a Southern Baptist Convention. He has a book on, on this particular topic on missions and sending church. And he says, the church, that gains the, the church gains the most when they send its best. The church gains the most when it sends its best. And that's what we see here in the book of Acts. Barnabas and Saul, seasoned ministers, they're prophets and teachers. They, you know, we know about Barnabas, the son of encouragement. And Saul, I mean, what a powerful ministry. They had to be sent out because the Holy Spirit said, separate for me, Barnabas and Saul. The man of God has said this before, and, and I will say it as well. You know, we should be not focused on our seating capacity, but our sending capacity. That's a, that's a, a complete mind shift when it comes to the church. That our focus is equip people, feed and build them up to the stature of Christ, and send them. You know, I was thinking about in my in my workplace. You know, uh, I you know I manage a few people, and there's many here who do the same. There's a tendency of, of sort of some managers they love to hoard their people, their best people. You know why? Because it is so much easier to get work done, right, with your best people. Uh, and so what that does is you see over time. It, you know, their growth will be great and great and great. And after that, it, it, it kind of tapers off. Like they have given the best of their ability at that level. Uh, and some short-sighted managers like to just hoard people that of potential because they want to get their work done. It's, it's a selfish desire and it may be a good one because they really respect that worker. But, and they really want them in the team because they bring so much, you know, unity in that team and get things done and all that. But... By holding people back, you are also doing great disservice to that person. And so, the same thing applies in the church. I'm not saying we need to develop some program or anything like that. I think when the Holy Spirit clearly speaks and says, separate this person for my ministry, the church ought to gladly send such people. And, and I, I just want to ask the church, make this part of your prayer request. We cannot just say, well, if the Holy Spirit uh, decides to call somebody, he'll just call somebody. If, if you have that attitude about every single prayer request of our life, how would things turn out? If we just say, well, God is going to take care of it. God is sovereign. No, we pray because we know that God hears our prayers. And one of our prayers ought to be, Lord, these young people in this congregation, these older men and women of God in this congregation, Lord, call some people for your ministry. There are people, there are laborers are needed for the harvest. Our second generation of young people in this church need to step up to ministry roles and need to be called for it. Not, not, I'm not saying you need to, this is not some demo, democracy program or, or some structured program that you just say, now you're graduated, now you can do this. No, it has to be done by the Spirit. And when the Spirit of God in His timing calls some people, the church ought to be praying for that moment. This is a dream. This ought to be a dream in the hearts of the church, the people in the church, that God would Come in in his sovereignty and separate people for his ministry. My time is really running out. Um, I, I, I'm going to keep going forward here. Fifth is exercising spiritual gifts. There's a couple of verses I wanted to read, but because of the lack of time, I'm going to skip it. But I think if I share this one story, you will get the point. Um, you know, one day I was... Uh, I was walking out of the church. I think I had a, I think our first one was born, and it was just a chaotic time. We were ready to get out and exit out, and, and uh, 
I think I can share this because Miss Andy is now with the Lord. Maria, my auntie, um, she stops me on the way and she says, I have a word for you. And she, I didn't understand. You know, she said it worse in Malayalam and especially Old Testament. I, I have less of a clue about about the Old Testament Malayalam. But she said something. She said anattam and uh, and she said vidya or something like that. So I was like, okay. You know, I, I didn't pay really a lot of attention. I said, thank you, Andy, and I walked out. Um, uh, I don't know the time frame, but maybe a couple of months later, uh, you know, God gave an opportunity to lead worship, and it was a blessed time of worship in the Lord. And I'm, you know, off, you know, over the course of time, I've learned how to not take pride in all those things and everything like that. Um, and I was like, you know, Lord, thank you that you gave me uh, the ability just to worship you in freedom and all that. And then I walk out, and Andy's like, do you remember the word I gave you? And uh, um, that's when I remembered she gave me a word uh, a while back. Um, and she said it again, and I... I told Vinita at the time, I was like, I, I was trying to find that worse. Uh, but what I took from it is probably most important is that I learned from that, and I'm being utterly honest, that, that when I leave my personal sin, the Lord will open doors in my life to, to serve him with freedom and to take, take me to the next level of his ministry. And... I'm thankful that she had the boldness to share that word for me. Uh, it is a very tough word to tell somebody that you think is doing okay. And, um, but, you know, the Lord gave her the word telling me to, to repent of my sin and, and telling me that once you are freed from that sin, he's going to use you for his glory. Hallelujah. So, so that has been with me ever since. And I, I am seeing the fruit of that in, in my daily walk with the Lord and in my ministry. So what am I saying? Exercising of spiritual gifts is absolutely important in the church of God. And nowadays, the spiritual gifts are being, uh, people are mocking it. And I, I agree with you. There are a lot of people that are making a lot of false prophecies. And it's a big issue in the church right now. But that still doesn't discount the fact that the Bible tells us to, to, desire, to desire for the gifts, especially that you prophesy. The purpose of prophecy is to build up the church. And it also, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, that it, when an unbeliever or outsider comes, he is convicted of his sin because he call, he's called into account because the secrets of his heart is disclosed. So falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. I truly believe there are people here with the prophetic gift in this, in this church. I, I truly believe that. I think for one reason or another, it has been kept back. Um, but I, I just want to encourage you in the Lord to fan into flame the gift of God. We need to exercise it in a, in a very wise manner. A lot of our service is going live and, and all of that. So at minimum, I think, and this is just my prescription, is that you write it in a note, hand it to the man of God. And if it's from the Lord, you know, he will, he will do what, whatever, it, you know, he might read it or he might decide to pray on it and read it later. So I'm just saying, I'm giving you that, that as an advice. If the Lord gives you a word for the church, please obey the Lord and, and listen for his voice. Now I'd like to invite the worship team to come forward. I'm, I'm sorry for taking more time than I ought on this. Um, and, and I'm going to go to the conclusion and then come back to the last element. So in the conclusion, what are we seeing as results? And this is the last slide. We're seeing that because the church became the church, there's relief for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. We can see that Peter is delivered from imprisonment and potential execution. The word of God is increased and multiplied. The Holy Spirit speaks to the prophets. And Paul and Barnabas are set apart for missions and sent. Just look at all the things that is happening when the church is the church. Now let me jump to the last component, last element in the local church. It is worship. Acts 13.2 says, while they were worshiping the Lord, while they were worshiping Jesus and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. So what is the difference between praising God and worshiping God? Praising God, you can praise anybody. You can praise people in the church. You can praise 
uh, your children. You can praise, and you can praise God. You can give thanks. But praise is not worship. And I'm really condensing this down to the core of it. But worship is seeing Jesus high and exalted. Without seeing Jesus, you cannot worship. When you see Jesus, you, you go, God, here's my bank balance. 100% to you, Lord. Here's my life, Lord. I see you now. Here's my life. I die. I die to myself, Lord. That's worship. So what we do here, when we sing songs, it is, it's only a means to see Jesus. There's nothing special in the songs. It's all about seeing Jesus. That's why in the Word, the Word is preached in power, people worship. Because they see Jesus high and exalted. Hallelujah. When I was preparing for this message, I really was dreaming in the Lord. A moment just us meditating on some portions of scripture. And I was trying to memorize this, but uh, I'm not good at it. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from, and let's stand in the presence of God. We're going to worship Jesus this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I believe there will be a change in our walk and a change in our church and change in our situations when we see Jesus high and exalted. Hallelujah. Let me read from you Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Hallelujah. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Just as the sunbeam comes through the dark cloud and we see the beauty, He is the radiance of the glory of God. God lives in unapproachable light, but Jesus is the sun rays that we can see. Because if you see God as He is, we will die. So God in His kindness, He stooped down to our level so that we can see Him. Hallelujah. He upholds the universe by the word of His power. Hallelujah. In the beginning was the word. The word was God, with God. The word was God. Through Him all things were made. Hallelujah. And Him being the radiance of God, Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He became just like us in every way. He's a human embodiment of God. And when we see Jesus, Jesus said, if you see me, you have seen the Father. He's the exact imprint of his nature. Hallelujah. I think about the woman that Isaiah sees. He says, Isaiah sees the Lord high and exalted. And then, and then Gospel of John it says that Isaiah spoke about what he, uh, of seeing the glories of Christ. And so what, G, what Isaiah saw there was Jesus, high and exalted. Hallelujah. I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and his train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. Two would they cover their face, two they covered their feet, and two he flew. And one called to one another said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory and the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke and and what did Isaiah do he said woe is me i am unclean hallelujah we see the whole, we see the holiness and we see the purity of christ oh lord can i even approach you i'm sorry for my sin lord i repent oh lord hallelujah hallelujah and here comes a seraphim with his hand, a burning coal that's been taken from the altar. And he touches his mouth then says, Behold, I have touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away. Your sin atoned for. In Hebrews it says, After making purifications for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. Hallelujah. He died for our sins. He took our sins on the cross. He said, it is finished. And he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he is waiting until all of his enemies come under his feet. Oh, that time is nearing church. And one day we will be rise up in the clouds in the midair. Those who have gone before us will be there before us. And we will be with him forever. Hallelujah. We will be joined together. Hallelujah. Lord, we pray, oh God, this moment that people will see uh, the full vision of Christ, O oh Lord. We know if we see one glimpse of you, our lives will be changed. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will do what you do, which is you will glorify Jesus to us, O oh Lord. That our lives will be completely 
completely changed, oh Lord God. Our attitude about the local church, our attitude about people, our attitude about our families will change, oh Lord, with one glimpse of Jesus. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor, God, for all you have done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.